All right, I think we are live now, and um, happy to have everyone here. Um, this is Andre. I'm the founder of the City Foundations. We based in Hong Kong, Singapore, and this is our owner's day. We have um, five uh, promising and also prominent speakers, panelists to join the panel co-developing Asia regions post COVID nineteen. So, as the panel implies, we talk about developing Asia and we talk about the post pandemic world. Um, Speaking of designing post pandemic world, it involves everyone. It takes a village to build the whole cities, and it takes government role, uh, government leader, and also definitely great effort of private sector to come together to to build a not just uh, renewed cities, but definitely uh, resilient and vibrant resilient economies that everyone can live comfortably in the future as well. So we have the panel today here, um, five amazing speakers. We have Dr. Long Wen. From uh, five CEO of um, uh, Big Mass Corporations, we have um, Jayesh from uh, Government of Telangana, and we have uh, Mr. Uh, Joy Devsan from uh, Oscar Analytics, Analytica, and also uh, Mr. Anu from Idea Center of Architects, and definitely at the end, uh, Rosa, Ms. Rosa from uh, Saudiana Advisory uh, from Pakistan. So. Let's start the panel by briefly introduce who you are. You know, uh, let us know more of what you are doing, especially during the very difficult time of COVID nineteen now. Uh, and also, uh, that would be great as request by the organizer. How do you see uh, the uh, outstanding Eastern, and also what could be potentially that actually government can join and uh, address a little bit better during the last, I would say, one year of COVID nineteen. Uh, what are you? What are you guys playing as an important role? That's in the one year that is so outstanding and so important that as a first message to the audience, maybe we can start with um, Mr. Jayesh from Government Telangana, from an IT or you know science perspective. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Andre. Good afternoon, fellow panelists. Greetings to all the participants. As uh, Andre briefly introduced, my name is uh, Jayesh Ranjan, and I work for a provincial government in uh, India. I represent the southern province of Telangana. Many of you would know our capital city much better. The capital city is Hyderabad, and I look after two portfolios. I look after the portfolios of uh, information technology, and the other portfolio of industries and investment. So the pandemic time has been uh, pretty rough uh, out here in India as well. And uh, at the provincial level, we had a very long uh, lockdown, spreading almost uh, eight months. My responsibilities during the lockdown period were number one to provide uh, immediate relief to all the industries, all the IT companies, whatever uh, they needed to do to continue their operations. Government had a number of plans and activities uh, rolled out for them. But most importantly, since the last uh, three months or so. I'm focusing quite a lot on the post-pandemic uh, economic recovery. These two subjects that I represent, the information technology and uh, industries, these are very vital contributors to the GSDP of our state and uh, our city, Hyderabad. Today enjoys a global reputation of being a very important technology hub, being a very important manufacturing hub for the life sciences, for the aerospace. And defense, and so on, and so forth. So, the adverse consequences of uh, pandemic, of course, uh, are slowly getting behind us, and there is a need to bring in new policies, new approaches, etc., to look at uh, quicker and faster uh, economic recovery. So, when we look at how do we develop uh, Asian regions post COVID, I want to make uh, two points. First is that uh, Asia itself is quite uh, heterogeneous. While we have uh, the Indian subcontinent on one side, which has certain kinds of common characteristics, on the other hand, we have countries like China, and then of course we have uh, Far East countries like Japan, Korea, and so on and so forth. So, as we all know, these countries are at uh, different trajectories. They have different priorities. They have different requirements. So, instead of talking of Asia as one big mass, we need to disaggregate uh, Asia. And uh, I would like to speak about uh, South Asia. South Asia, of course, uh, is largely the Indian subcontinent plus a couple of other uh, countries also. And uh, what I would like to share with you is something very real, which is going on for the last three years, uh, three months rather. I don't want to give any hypothetical or a speculative answer. I would like to actually tell you 
a very about a very important initiative which has been uh, going on for the last 3 months as i said this initiative has been put together by the world economic forum all of you i'm sure will agree that uh, regardless of where we are and what sectors of economy we operate in and what scale is our uh, operations digitalization is going to play a very very important role in the post covid economic recovery and uh, the world economic forum has put together a regional action group for south asia and uh, one of the tasks which this uh, regional action group has taken is to identify how can digitalization serve the needs of uh, the economy in this region and uh, i i feel very proud to share with you that i am the co-chair of uh, that group there are co-chairs from other countries as well i i represent uh, india in that uh, working group and uh, we have decided to focus on two things one is on uh, home based schooling now i do not know about the rest of uh, asia but at least in uh, the subcontinent particularly in three countries that are more represented in our working action group that is india bangladesh and nepal uh, none of the schools have started and uh, as you know uh, if you have a gap year if children are not able to go to schools at all then uh, they miss out on many many fundamental uh, aspects so how do you ensure home based schooling but there are multiple challenges in that home based schooling there are people who live in uh, areas of very low connectivity there are families who do not have access to devices at, at all so we are looking at how do you provide a home based solution education solution within these uh, challenges we are also looking at how to equip the teachers in running these kind of uh, solutions and finally how do you evaluate or assess the impact this teaching learning process is making and we have covered lots of ground the another theme that we have taken up in our uh, working group on accelerating digital transformation is on small businesses now uh, i'm sure all of you will agree that while the economic consequences of this uh, pandemic lockdown etc has been very harsh on everyone but it is the small businesses which have been impacted the most and uh, again our group has decided to look at what are the digital tools which are available so are there uh, affordable erp solutions are there affordable crm solutions and most importantly how does an smb train or build the capacities of its employees to run these kind of digital platforms digital solutions what are the e-commerce opportunities that smbs can have how can smbs get uh, better access to financing using digital method so this is another set of issues which our working group is looking at but the point which i am trying to make is not so much about the content of the working group but the nature of the uh, institutional arrangement world economic forum has taken this initiative it has created this regional action group for south asia there are multiple other working groups also focusing on different other tracks my working group looks after digital digitalization we have a very uh, a uh, mixed uh, representation in our working group so there are representatives from the government there are representatives from the private sector there are representatives from industry associations there are representatives from think tanks even uh, multilateral uh, donor agencies are present so for instance in our uh, working group the undp representatives of india nepal and bangladesh are uh, represented and uh, the way we have uh, gone about our business is that first we have held a country level discussion so i led a discussion in uh, india mr anir choudhury who works with the prime minister's office in bangladesh he led a discussion in bangladesh someone else led a discussion in nepal and then we had uh, we assimilated all synthesized all the important thoughts we decided the priorities of this region and just few days ago we had a cross country discussion to understand how do we make the next steps in in uh, these uh, identified area so this particular arrangement that you look at a region you understand the commonalities and the common challenges of a region you bring together diverse stakeholders you work uh, bottoms up i mean instead of in, imposing solutions which someone else might have worked out in a different context you work bottoms up bring uh, various variances amongst the countries also while south asia is one geography a geographical entity but within the six countries the seven countries of south asia also there are uh, differences so this in in my opinion is going to be a very very practical and a very useful solution on looking at how do you develop uh, asian regions uh, post covid so thought of sharing my personal experience and how we are going about doing that right in the beginning thank you so much uh, thank you for sharing uh, mr jayesh so Uh, I will pass the time to Jaydeep a bit first. Um, 
be good to know, uh, you know, your work and also how do you uh, respond to the statement that we just mentioned. Hello, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jaideep. Um, I suppose I'm a little bit uh, different from the other panelists insofar as uh, I don't represent a, a government or, or an industry. Uh, I work for Oxford Analytica, which is a, a political risk consultancy based in the United Kingdom. Uh, so as a political risk analyst, uh, I'm interested in macro analysis, uh, or in other words, the big picture. So, you know, I research and write about geopolitics and macroeconomics in, in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, so really, I'll be looking to bring some insights into the sorts of risks and opportunities facing governments and firms in those regions uh, as they attempt to contain the pandemic's uh, spread and, and revive uh, badly hit economies. Um, I mean, I think there's a few themes worth touching on with respects to the easements and joint developments that uh, governments might propose going forwards. Uh, and I'll just signpost this very quickly. Um, and I think there are already signs of governments and other entities proposing joint responses to the challenges posed by COVID-19. Uh, so ASEAN, for example, uh, is at least attempting to spur region-wide cooperation in finding ways to fight the coronavirus and rebuild pandemic hit economies. Uh, and looking forward, and this is maybe the interesting, uh, slightly, uh, um, you know, uh, original part, I think strategic rivalry uh, between some of the world's major players and middle powers will ensure continued uh, disaster diplomacy, as it were. So, you know, this might be something interesting to, to look at a, a little bit further. Uh, more generally, a key issue we'll, we will be addressing, I think, is um, rising inequality in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, and the challenge to ensure inclusive development. Uh, and really, you know, growing wealth disparity is just one dimension of this problem. Uh, there are serious concerns about uh, gender inequality, for example, uh, and other types of vulnerability that have increased uh, during the pandemic. Now, on the upside, uh, we will be talking about which sectors may be primed to lead the way in post-pandemic economic revival. Uh, we've already heard uh, a little bit about um, uh, the opportunities uh, entailed in the digital economy. Um, I guess we'll be discussing the increasing emphasis on teleworking, uh, although we should be mindful that uh, most people do not have the luxury of working from home. So when we talk about bottom-up solutions, this is something very important to, to remember. Uh, and insofar as we are interested in thinking uh, about the potential easements for Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities across the region, uh, I think it may be useful to consider the growing importance of the second-hand economy. Uh, so I think that'll be very uh, interesting to, to come back to if we have time. Uh, and lastly, um, I would hope at some point uh, to say a few words about how we view political risk in this time of COVID-19. Uh, because when we ask ourselves whether increased foreign investment can help turn pandemic hit economies around, uh, we should not forget that ongoing political instability in many of the region's countries can be a significant disincentive for stakeholders. Uh, and in certain cases, this instability uh, has a momentum of its own uh, rather than being expressly related to the pandemic. Uh, and it's only going to rise in the coming months. So, you know, I'll leave it there for now and, and look forward to maybe elaborating on some of these matters further. Thank you so much, um, Joy Deep, sir. Uh, and you, um, from an architect perspective, you know, uh, well, that would be great to learn about your background and also probably would be great to hear after the macro view, how would that uh, statement actually uh, be response from, you know, planning or towns or architectures to say, yep, you have your mute, your mute, Neil. Yeah. Uh, you're mute. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Um, so I, being an architect and urban planner, uh, I'd be talking from the point of, uh, uh, from the point of uh, urban planning and uh, city planning, etc. cetera. Um, so I think uh, this COVID pandemic has a, uh, Expose the fact that the world cities and nations all over the world were ill prepared to deal with such a 
pandemic of uh, the, such a scale and magnitude. So that that fact has been now exposed very well. So what it also means is that the cities were not really uh, planned around the concept of wellness. For the last five years, I've been a proponent of planning cities around the theme of wellness and happiness. Now, our cities are typically being, um, uh, you know, planned around the main three components, that is livability, workability, and mobility. However, when you talk about livability, actually the first and most important thing that should come to our mind and come into play is the is, is wellness of the citizens. And wellness of the citizens will eventually lead to the happiness of the citizens. So when you plan a city and going forward, when you, for instance, Amravati, where uh, Mr. Rajesh Renton is, uh, um, you know, uh, probably involved with Amravati, the new city uh, in south of India, is being planned in uh, uh, planned as a new city, and it is is being now executed. So one of the most important things that comes to my mind is the fact that uh, the, the factors that will propel health of the citizens should be taken care. Planning, giving open spaces, actually making the city a walkable city, actually designing and constructing buildings that can be walked up rather than you know, uh, using elevators and escalators to go up, etc. So, to this this kind of encouraging physical activities of the citizens will breed in, will breed a healthier society and bring in uh, 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 a society which 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 will require less and less um, health support from formal institutions such, such as hospitals, etc. So, a city where people can bicycle around would be a good idea of health. So I think uh, organizations such as WHO, World Bank, and Asia Development Bank, etc., when they when they come in uh, to support the development of various regions in Asia, probably they should provide a model for the future development. I've always felt that it's left to the local authorities most of the time. I've worked with organizations uh, on five, six projects, organizations like Hardco in India, where they will finance local uh, uh, organizations like municipal organiz- municipalities, corporations, etc., on various projects. But it is left to the organization as to how to develop those regions and with the result that they don't have a uh, prototype model to follow. So my, in my opinion, uh, organize, world, world organizations like WHO, World Bank, ADB, etc. If they can provide a prototype model uh, which the local bodies can follow, that will be good. And then information technology uh, and digital technology and going forward, even artificial intelligence will play, I feel, a vital role in uh, bringing in in, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, integrating various aspects of the three fundamentals I just listed out, namely livability, workability, and mobility, especially urban mobility going forward, I think will be controlled by digital technology a lot. So I will just uh, wrap up this two, three minutes of my um, initial uh, introductory talk that uh, by, by saying that Fundamentally, a city has to be designed around the theme of wellness and happiness of the citizens and economy and other things should then be oriented towards these central themes. And mobility should be designed and should be conceived, designed and executed with the digital technology and cooperation from world bodies. And ideally, there should be prototypes to be followed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Anu. Uh, now, uh, Rotha, uh, how would you believe? I mean, how would you think about from a from a finance or from the you know project financing perspective uh, with all the frameworks and also uh, design? Uh, 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 previous, the previous three speakers just mentioned. Uh, how would that finance? 
how to structure a more inclusive framework that different uh, now now in the spectrum we have a lot of different financiers uh, in target classes the uprising number of family offices in Asia how, how would you think that the private sector of the financial and uh, what would you advise the perspective that the private sector can take to you know, really get the projects to the land if you can execute okay um well um good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, andre thank you for the question uh just briefly uh I'm a founder of Sagziana Advisory. It's a boutique advisory firm. And uh, we work with uh, entrepreneurs and material companies to um, attract strategic and financial investors to restructure their um, debt and uh, equity financing. Also, we uh, do strategic advisory and uh, what is very important at these times, um, as pandemic affected uh, drastically the financial performance of the companies. So now uh, many companies um, are looking to restructure their debt and um, assets uh, um, and their asset structures. Yeah. So what I see at the moment is uh, many companies. Uh, have liquidity issues and uh, it is very important for most companies uh, to resolve those issues otherwise uh, there might be a number of uh, bankruptcies uh, and this is uh, I would say not only related to the Central Asian region I would say that this is related to uh, like um, uh, companies all over the world and uh, actually what I have seen in terms of um, raising finance, uh, there are a number of companies, there are lots of companies looking for finance and there are lots of investors looking for the companies to invest into. And what is surprising is that uh, what I at least observe is that it would seem that uh, there are less investments during those COVID times. But in fact, it's otherwise, yeah? More and more uh, funds are being raised. And uh, also, uh, it's an interesting uh, trend, which I noticed, that there are more investments from the VC part rather than uh, private equity part. So, uh, meaning that uh, there are also some kind of um, trend uh, in terms of investors, those investors who are more, uh, who have more like kind of online skills, they can, they do those transactions online. Whereas those investors who still have uh, kind of old school of doing investments, right? Like meeting the company, um, firstly, like understanding the team, yeah, understanding and meeting the founders, yeah. So here uh, I see less investments. And uh, well, in terms of uh, pandemic effect again, yeah, I see that there are lots to be for private and government partnerships and for international organizations, yeah, in terms of supporting entrepreneurs and companies in order to promote the business models that are sustainable, that are sustainable in terms of uh, business as well as in terms of uh, environment. And actually, there are such models uh, on the market. It's just the matter of um, understanding them and also the matter of uh, implementing those models. Yeah. Thank you, Rosa. Um, we will get back to you on this particular uh, perspective. I think so far we have very interesting different points of views and domains. And lastly, we would love to have Dr. Long as well. Uh, I believe Dr. Long, from, in the case of Vietnam, they'll be very interesting. So how government, you know, more different 
development and also how private sector look at so far overall the post post pandemic rebuilding in Vietnam or in your city context. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. Um, so I come from Vietnam, and um, I come from Binh Dương province. It's an industrial province in Vietnam, um, and uh, they are moving now to high tech industry and smart city. Um, um, I'm the, uh, currently, I'm the VP CEO of uh, the Becamex Corporation. It's the largest corporation in Vietnam for industrial park and uh, urban area development. And um, what we can see in Vietnam, it, uh, maybe you have heard on on, um, on media. Um, I'm sorry, Rosa, can, can you make your uh, microphone mute? Yeah, because I, I hear back your, your uh, sound in in your side okay so uh, in vietnam maybe you have heard on uh, media that um, our gr uh, G gdp is still growing quite quickly so 1.6 percent for the whole vietnam and uh, moreover we uh, stopped the pandemic in our country from some some months ago so until now inside of vietnam we have no uh, corona virus uh, infected people uh, since i think like three months so uh, in our province particularly we uh, get the uh, growth is about the gdp growth is about 6.7 percent so it's quite high until now um, so what what is the most important thing we did is in fact we try to stop the pandemic at the beginning uh, when we can affirm that there there, there, there is almost no corona uh, infected people in our country then we start to reopen step by step our economy, but still, you know, inside of the country. And concerning the question uh, you posed uh, at the beginning about the foreigner, uh, we just put about 14 days a quarantine obligation for everyone to get into Vietnam. Uh, so this uh, easement uh, seemed to be very uh, efficient in our country with uh, the number I already gave to you guys. Uh, so in Vietnam, we still believe, uh, we believe that the, the most important factor to grow is still the internal fox. But to get the breakthrough, uh, in social economy, uh, the external fox is extremely important. Uh, you know, it's a key success, a key factor to, to get a breakthrough. So therefore, uh, the greater, um, foreign investment, uh, should be the key, uh, for, for us and we uh, try to um, we, we try to stimulate even uh, in the COVID uh, the pre collaboration the connection with foreign uh, through the online system um, and maybe you have heard uh, on media that uh, Vietnam ju uh, just finished uh, now we successfully arrived or uh, the um, Europe Vietnam FDA, uh, you know, uh, during the COVID time, it's quite special, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, we continue with uh, this way to prepare the uh, the post COVID uh, situation. And uh, in our point of view, um, uh, as a company or working on 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 on, on uh, you know on the real market, what we feel is uh, there is a new recognition of people. Uh, of, of the market, uh, of the people, of the citizen uh, during this moment. The first one, uh, what people already talk, uh, like um, Janice or Anil or uh, Joydeep and, and even Rosa already uh, affirm uh, that uh, people focus on digitalization. Uh, you know, we, we have a new, um, new habit of customer now. Uh, people used to use uh, digital uh, tools much more than before and the second thing is uh, people start to think about sustainability and green much more than before uh, and and they accept to to get risk uh, to to uh, sacrifice uh, some uh, economy factors to um, to get a better sustainability 
so what Rosa also um, emphasized on the uh, some positive point of finance. Normally, we can think that no, uh, for uh, uh, they they will have uh, a shock for uh, uh, investment uh, uh, during the COVID. But Rosa affirmed that even in VC part, for example, is uh, is raising. So it's more it show that people start to accept the risk and the innovation more than before. Uh, and in our government, uh, you know, we uh, we try to open the door in advance, uh, but not in the in the physical part of view, but in the you know in mindset part of view. And uh, in our company, for example, uh, we also uh, use the moment in COVID uh, where uh, every uh, you know like daily business is uh, um, increasing uh, in uh, decreasing. Uh, then we. Uh, prepare for digitalization. We plan the new business model after, um, you know, to prepare for the after COVID, the, the, the post COVID. So in, in, including the connecting with other foreign development, uh, or, um, uh, we uh, can open some new, uh, business, um, movement, uh, focusing on technology and digital, digital tools. Uh, and we also make a lot of webinar, meeting, et cetera. So uh, this is our part view. We think that the COVID uh, is, uh, of course, is uh, one of the, the largest crisis in our uh, history, but also will open a new door for Asian country, uh, particularly uh, the ASEAN here uh, for, uh, for a new future. Uh, you know, everything will change and, uh, and can, can create a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. So what I would like to share with you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Um, I will have a follow-up question to, first of all, to um, JH first. And uh, I think that this question may also echo a little bit what um, Joy has mentioned about the, the macro and also the political risk or overall risk perspective. Uh, uh, JH, you mentioned about the institutional arrangement or you know, collaborating with different uh, regional organizations like WEF or other uh, corporations in South Asia. Um, how does the government take the role in India to drive? Um, you, you mentioned, I mean, multiple speakers here mentioned about digitalizations and you know creating new economy. So in the process of government creating new economy, how does the public sector or the government or policymakers drive to create a new asset um, that the private sector can come in? And how the creation of new asset basically can help to you know not just addressing the financial or the liquidity issues as a as a whole city but also uh, also addressing maybe what and you mentioned the well-being resilience of people um and, and at the end how that would address the 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 risk that um joined the mentions as a whole Yes, Andre. So, uh, <clears throat> in my opinion, one of the most uh, critical responsibility of the governments across the region at this point in time is to promote uh, inclusive development. See, we have already, when I mentioned earlier, when I delivered my opening remarks, that within the economy, we are focusing in particular on the small businesses. So, there is a reason for doing so. We know that big businesses have also been impacted. In fact, there are certain sectors of economy where uh, we can't even see how close the revival is. But we still believe that the big boys still have deeper pockets. They can withstand these kind of shocks. They can manage things by themselves. But uh, the government definitely owns a responsibility to the small businesses. Similarly, when I spoke about digitalization in the education process, and I spoke about people who don't have access to devices or who are in a low low connectivity area, obviously these are people who are not very rich. Typically, the it is the poor person who won't have access to devices, or he will be living in some very remote or a very rural location where the connectivity problems will be there. So definitely, government has a very important role. And uh, I will continue with the theme of digitalization that I spoke about. Now, in my province, in Telangana, one of the foremost uh, tasks that we have taken upon ourselves is, first of all, we believe in digitalization. We know that digitalization will definitely help companies and individuals and the society at large rebound. 
but most important most fundamental to promote the goals of digitalization is to create digital infrastructure and uh, what we notice is that this particular region the south asian region in particular is uh, having very low d- digital uh, infrastructure penetration so uh, in my province we are attempting something which uh, once it is achieved will become really historic so we have started a project again this project was there in the past as well but uh, covid has really helped us or uh, made us fast track that uh, project this project is called t fiber and what we aim to do under this project is to ensure that every home in our province is connected with a very reliable optic fiber cable so in a way i will be providing internet right to the doorstep regardless of where you live and it's a very large project our uh, province has a, has uh, about 8 uh, and a half million homes and this is a very large number and obviously these 8 and a half million are spread all over the place some of them are in rural areas very remote areas some of them are in the middle of forest some are uh, some are on hill tops but regardless of where you are we will provide uh, optic fiber cable right till your doorstep and uh, this will amaze you that we are going to deliver all this within one year in the next one year every home in the province of telangana will be connected and then thereafter as you can easily imagine the all the deliveries of digital digital education digital health e-commerce e-governance services everything will be will be made available but we also have taken a reality check we know f- through our experience and we know the realities of the region which is that even if i provide broadband to the doorstep there will still be hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who will not really be enamored by this and it is not that i tell you that hey there is a broadband at your doorstep and you rush out and you start buying laptops and devices and so on and so forth there will be many people either who won't even understand what value does digital bring to me and obviously there will be some number of people who won't be able to afford it so we are also figuring out ways around this so one is that we have started again this was something which was happening before the pandemic as well but we have decided to run it much more aggressively and systematically which is a program on digital literacy how do you create digital literacy another is uh, assisted access to internet so in every village in our state in our province we are putting digital kiosks which will be run by a local entrepreneur so even if i don't have access to devices i can access uh, digital services at some common kiosk and finally what we noticed from experiences that people start uh, believing in digital the buy in of the community is more in digital if i am able to showcase solutions and uh, products which mean a lot to them so if i am able to tell them that you are doing some agriculture in the rural areas using some uh, 19th century practices but here is a digital tool which will help you double your incomes and if i show that how it works the buy in definitely will be much much more so i believe that uh, in the region the south asian region that i i represent first of all collaboration with all the stakeholders and i'm glad that you spoke about private sector the government's intent is there but eventually the delivery has to happen through private sector partners and we are very clear that uh, the government is not the agency which is the repository of all the wisdom the wisdom lies outside and our responsibility is to bring the people who have that wisdom to serve the interests of the people so this is the way things will pan out uh, hopefully in the next uh, few months and few years at least in this uh, region um thank you jayesh um i would i would bring a little bit context you mentioned to maybe dr long and rosa if rosa is here and he is clearly uh so how i mean what is the seek i mean dr long you mentioned about the, the the rapid uh hue of vietnam in the process i mean in the course of covid-19 in the past one year uh how does the how does the you know business community in, in Vietnam remain very active and is it because of the government also rigorously regulates or rig- rigorously you know loosen the the regulations or promote a lot of new policies that really favorable to businessmen and you know entrepreneurs or companies in Vietnam that remain very active in the countries uh, yes thank you it's a very nice question um You know in in Vietnam we have a quite large internal market we have about 100 uh, million people in our country 
Um, and even our, uh, for example, the most touchable um, domain in uh, in uh, in uh, COVID is uh, tourism, for example. So in our country, uh, our tourism is still depend a lot on the internal uh, market. So it uh, doesn't uh, extremely impact it. But the the most important, I think, in our country um, is we try to choose the solution at the beginning. We accept to sacrifice our uh, our grow economy uh, to protect the health of people. So we close the door uh, and uh, you know like pray uh, caution uh, for for COVID. Then uh, now in our market uh, is almost uh, no uh, Corona virus infected people anymore. So uh, our internal market is still uh, is returned. That is a very important factor. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, beside of that, uh, our government, uh, you know, now everyone more or less believes that uh, the post-COVID will open the door for for new economy. And, uh, you know, everyone will come back to work after the long sleep time, you know. Then uh, then uh, the, the, the value chain is also changing in in the uh, in the global market and giving a lot of opportunity for uh, uh, manufacturing country and also for a developing country. So with this belief in Vietnam, the government try to uh, support enterprise and showing uh, the the rest of the world that we are open opening the door and we prepare very well uh, we to, uh, to, welcome, to welcome to welcome the. To welcome. the um, uh, the, the the investment and uh, that is the reason why we still raise quickly our investment during the COVID time, even online. You know, not not uh, not every time uh, with the uh, direct contact, but we we still ra- raising our economy. And uh, 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 I just give you an example. Even during COVID, we arrived to open the Europe Vietnam. Uh, free trade ma- agreement. So it's very important information for all the investors if they want to invest in Vietnam. And um, the last one is in Vietnam, uh, before protecting the health of people and, uh, you know, anti-COVID, we also try to uh, support enterprise and make them understand that the new age is opening with digitalization and uh, innovation and and uh, you know uh, sustainability, etc. So most of our enterprise believe on that. So everyone try to to reform them, themselves during the COVID time. I, I give you an example for our company after the the very strong digitalization uh, in our, uh, of the company, uh, we uh, reduce the cost of timing, uh, uh, the cost of um, of you know administration work like uh, 50% and uh, we also um, um, make uh, all the work uh, faster like 600 to 700% so you see the the efficiency we got uh, after uh, digitalization uh, in our company so imagine if the whole market firstly they still keep the belief even the work is uh, you know uh, increasing uh, but uh, but they still keep the belief that uh, we have a, a future and we also uh, see the uh, possibility through the the pre connection with other uh, foreign market and for, uh, other foreign investment and we also see the the, the clear picture of the future with uh, digitalization with innovation etc so with all of these things uh, our economy is still growing uh, and uh, one more time I, I have to affirm that um, the choice of Vietnamese government on uh, precaution of COVID, I think, is a very good choice. Uh, in in the condition that our company, our country is emerging country, you know, and our country is quite big in the term of internal market, is enough to survive during the COVID time, and uh, keep the belief in the future. That is what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor.